All right. So it is 7.08, so I think we can start. Um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of CMRS, the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies at AUC, I would like to welcome all of you for our talk tonight. And I also would like to tell you how delighted, cannot move too much, um, how delighted I am to host Dr. Hakim Elrostom, our guest tonight, for his fascinating lecture and timely lecture, Rethinking the Post-Ottoman Armenian Forced Migration and the Making of the Middle East. First, I would like to give you just a few words about CMRS. We are a graduate center at AUC, and we offer masters and graduate diplomas in migration and refugee studies. And I know we have a couple of students and alumni here. Um, what makes us unique is our interdisciplinary perspective. In our faculty, we have lawyers, political scientists, and sociologists. The CMRS also has various outreach and research projects. We work closely with the refugee community. And recently, we have launched a series of projects involving international academic institutions. We have also been organizing a series of talks, some on the new Cairo campus and also here, obviously, in Tahrir. And we invite scholars who work on the multiple dimensions of migration and refugee studies from a variety of perspectives to discuss their work. So again, tonight, I am honored to host Hakem al as our guest. Hakem is a colleague and a friend at IUC. He belongs to the big SAPE department, which is Sociology, Anthropology, Psychology, and Egyptology. He belongs to the Anthropology Unit, and is an assistant professor in Anthropology. And he's also the fearless director of the graduate program in Sociology and Anthropology. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about Hakim's background. Before joining AUC, Hakim was a lecturer in History and Armenian Studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I think he's also a little bit of a Said expert, and he's the co-editor of Edward Said, A Legacy of Emancipation and Representation, that was published in 2010. Currently, he's working on a book manuscript on ethnographic silences and indigenous politics in Turkey. Hakan earned his PhD from the London School of Economics for a thesis focused on Anatolian Fragment, Armenian between Turkey and France. His research investigated the past of the Armenian population that remained in Anatolia after the signing of the Lausanne Treaty of 1923 and their subsequent migration to France in the 1970s. Now, I have a small anecdote for you. The first time I heard Dr. Rustin talk, it was to some of my CMRS students in a class focused on transnationalism and diaspora. And Hakan was discussing Armenian in France and their successful integration. Now, it was a fascinating presentation. First, I'm French, so I was particularly interested and taken by Hakan's very subtle description of the negotiation between the French state and Armenian diasporic institution with his ethnographic approach and his approach also rooted in anthropology and in history. So later on, I decided to approach Hakem and ask him to present again for one of our similar stocks. It was very difficult because he's very busy, it's very hard to you know, schedule a talk, so, so we, we discuss on and on. And then he told me he wanted to talk about Armenians and our you know, program coordinator found a date for him. And then I just gave him the date. She didn't know what the topic was. And the date is today just one day before the commemoration 100 years of the Armenian genocide. It was a coincidence, but I think it's a fascinating coincidence, and it makes tonight's lecture particularly meaningful. Hakan's research interest, I think you guessed it, uh, lie in the intersection between anthropology and history, ethnographic silence, archival, archival absence, and settler colonialism. Geographically, Hakan's research focused on post-Ottoman states, Anatolia, the Middle East, and the Balkans, where he has researched nation building, sectarianism in everyday life, 
This elevation, all these words are very long for me to say in English, of religious identities and the politics of minorities, majority in governing population, diversity, legally ambiguous population, and sectarianism in everyday life with reference to Armenians, Arab Jews, Christians in the Middle East, and Muslims in Europe. Again, enough. Tonight's lecture is rethinking the post-Ottoman Armenian force migration and the making of the Middle East. It is based on a chapter that is forthcoming in a book edited by Dr. Soraya Altorki. She's the head of the anthropology unit at AUC. Tonight's lecture, I think, really embodies very well many of Hakem's preoccupation and many aspects of his research, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about it. So, Hakem, the floor is yours. You have about 50 minutes, and then we'll take some questions. Please join me in welcoming Hakem for his talk. Thank you very much, Alex, for a very uh, generous uh, introduction. It's such a pleasure to uh, be uh, speaking here. Uh, it's the first time I actually present my work uh, in Cairo and in, uh, at the AUC, and definitely the first time to speak in this beautiful Oriental Hall. It has always been uh, a desire that I do that, and that's why I insisted I'm going to, sp to speak under the condition that it's in Oriental Hall. So I really thank uh, Alex and the Center for uh, Refugee and Migration Studies for this uh, generous uh, uh, invitation. <clears throat> Out of approximately 2 million Ottoman Armenians alive in 1914, only, only 77,433 remained as Turkish citizens as the Republic of Turkey was founded in October 1923. I have focused my research on the 24,300 and four, and many, many others who are undocumented that continues to live in the vast Anatolian plateau in post-genocide Turkey. These figures are according to the 1927 Turkish national statistics. Mihran's parents were among those who remained. Mihran was born in 1943 in the town of Arabgir, in the eastern province of Malatya. He now lives in Istanbul, where I met him. He is keen to document the Armenian history of his town through old photographs. Before the First World War, he said, there used to be around 10 Armenian churches, which he listed to me. When he was growing up, there was no functioning church left. Out of the two or 3,000 Armenians lived in Arab gear in the early Republican period, currently only four remain. Why did he and many other Armenian genocide survivors leave Arabgir, or rather leave Anatolia to places like Istanbul, Syria, Lebanon, France, and elsewhere? And how could we understand and analyze regional history through the lives of few thousand remaining largely undocumented Armenians? Like many Armenians who immigrated to Istanbul in the 1950s from Anatolia, Mehran le left Arab gear in 1955 to attend the Armenian high school of Surbhach Tebrevank, or the Seminary of the Holy Cross, leaving his family behind. He emphasized that while many Armenians chose to leave, there were systematic efforts by the Turkish state to fragment the Kurdish population from areas where Kurds constituted a demographic majority. While Armenians were implicated with the Kurds who were targeted by the nationwide settlement law, the Iskan Kanunu of 1934, Armenians experienced locally specific incentives to leave to Istanbul. They were either asked to leave their homes or Arab gear altogether with a week's notice to, so that Muslim refugees from the Balkans would be settled in their place or to host uh, Balkan Muslim families in their houses. So many Armenians chose to leave, Mihran said. He uttered the word chose with hesitation to emphasize that he thought that Armenians did not have a real choice to stay after being asked to leave or share their homes with refugees from the Balkans. Fragments of silenced histories, such as those traced through life stories, memoirs, 
are an opportunity to contest both the colonial and the nationalist constru construction of population or and geopolitical regional categories. Taking the Armenian population as a perspective, I bring to the foreground the subverted histories and social relations among populations within and beyond the Middle East in two terrains. The first is the intertwined history with the Balkan Muslims, which would con contextualize the ignored role of the Balkans in shaping the societies and histories of the post-Ottoman Middle East. The second are the overlapping territories between Armenians and Kurds to explore the centrality of Kurdish history in writing the undocumented Armenian history in post-genocide Turkey. I want to emphasize that my work does not claim to represent the marginal point of view of a minority population. Rather, taking Anatolian Armenians as an ethnographic perspective will not only map the Armenian experience, but also shed light on the centers of power from the vantage point of the margin. Whether that center is the Turkish state, Istanbul elite versus the provinces, the Kurdish landlords in the southeast, the elite Armenian institutions in Istanbul or the diaspora, etc. Obviously, the margin shifts vis-a-vis -vis the center. So the critical intellectual and political practice should also keep shifting in opposition to the centers of power. Before exploring the intertwined histories and overlapping territories, I want to explore the assumptions that, is, that this paper is struggling with. One pertains to the Middle East and the other to Armenian historiography. The concept, the first is the concept of the Middle East. The concept of the Middle East emerged from European and American military colonial impositions that started in the 19th century. The Middle East denoted the lands between the Ottoman Empire and British India, while the Near East included the Ottoman territories. The coast of North Africa was the French designation that referred to France's colonial colonies in the north of the continent and later included the Italian colony of Libya. The current designation, then, the Middle East and North Africa, known by the acronym MENA, arises from combining the Near East, the French North African colonies, and Libya. In other words, MENA is mainly the non-European provinces of the Ottoman Empire, adding to, it, to them Morocco and Iran. Since the, since the European Ottoman provinces had a different tra trajectory of representation, or, or rather misrepresentation, they have been balkanized, as Maria Todorova uh, argues, and she raises the question of whether balkanism is the same as the way the Middle East has been orientalized in the Saidian way. Both the Middle East and the Balkans were constructed as an other to Europe and the West. The Balkans were on the margins of Europe, and the Middle East was the other side of its conceptual and ideological borders. Some also like to argue physical borders. Scholars and policymakers alike working on post-Ottoman societies continue the colonial legacy of dividing the ex-Ottoman territories into two conceptually and ideologically separate regions. Yet both continue to be central to the invention of the concept of Europe. We see that very well in the ways in which academic departments and area studies associations are labeled. We rarely find an association dedicated to the study of the Middle East and the Balkans together. The second is Armenian historiography. While there is a plethora of studies on Armenians in the diaspora and recently also on the Armenians of Istanbul, there is a dearth in the literature on this population who continued living in their native villages and cities in the vast Anatolian plateau. The reason for this, and this is what was also the challenge of my uh, research, is the lack of archives, church and government archives. And whether archives, wh whatever archives th th there is, are either inaccessible and scattered, as well as a few remaining churches and schools ended up closing, mostly in the early Republican period. And when I started my research, when I went to Istanbul trying to look at some Armenian school archives or church archives, I went to the Patriarchate and they told me, well, we, we have nothing. So in your research, if you're able to find any archives, 
please let us know. We would be very interested to, to know them. And then after a while, of course, obviously I was, didn't have access to any archives, so I, uh, I said that it is easier for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a historian into the Armenian archives in Turkey. <laughs> So uh, this, uh, this table that we see here is, if we can imagine the Ottoman Armenian population as one entity, uh, we, those, who are, uh, those, there is those who are killed during the genocide and those who survived the genocide. And I'm, more, I'm obviously interested in the survivors as an anthropologist. Now, I divide the survivors into those who survived in the diaspora, whether in the Middle East or Europe or, the, or, or North America, and those who remained in Turkey or, or Armenia, that's one category. The other category is those who remained in Turkey after the Lausanne Treaty of 1923, and this is basically the population that I start my research with. Now, again, the Armenian citizens of Turkey are not a homogeneous population. There is those who uh, remained in Istanbul, those who remained uh, as Armenians in Anatolia, and there is a very important distinction between the two because those who remained in Istanbul uh, were protected by the provisions of the Lausanne Treaty, so their communal institutions, the schools, the hospitals, and uh, the churches were intact. Some of them were confiscated, uh, but the majority of, uh, of them weren't, while the, the, the ones who remained in Anatolia, all the churches and the schools ended up closing uh, in, uh, during the Republican period, sometimes because of the conflict with the Kurds, sometimes uh, they would just uh, destroy a cemetery to build uh, a highway. Uh, and, and for, for many reasons. And the, the, the last one are the Armenians who survived the genocide by converting to Islam during or the early Republican period. And this is, again, yet another category in research. Now, there is a lot of research on Y3 and Y5, those who remained in Istanbul, because the Istanbul population is very well documented. There are newspapers, there are institutions that, uh, that, that, that in which they, they could be traced. While, and currently, uh, the, a lot of Turks uh, or Turkish citizens and Kurds are discovering the fact that they have an Armenian grandmother. So, and they start investigating their own family histories in that. And there are a lot of memoirs and uh, even more uh, uh, books that tackle that population. So leaving Y4, those who remained as Armenians in Istanbul, out of the scope of a lot of, uh, of uh, anthropological and, uh, and historical studies. And this is where I uh, decided to make an, an intervention. So it is, this church chart makes it clear that the victimhood of, Ar of Ottoman Armenians is not homogeneous. It is important to note that the victims of genocide are not only dead. Genocides have their living victims as well. Those who lost their families, lands, properties, and those uh, and were in exile in which we call the diaspora, and those who could only survive in Turkey under hidden identities and conversion are also victims. In other words, they survived three policies of erasure, the population that I'm interested in, those who remained in, in, in uh, Anatolia. Uh, they survived three policies of erasure implemented on them, either through direct state policy, such as deportation and genocide, or indirect, such as policies of Turkification, Kurdification, and Islamization, due to social pressures or local conflict in uh, the Anatolian villages, as I will explore uh, later. Again, yeah, I think, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so th now, tackling the biases in Armenian historiography, as we can see that the majority of historians or historians of modern Armenian history usually provide the following periodization of Armenian history. They start with Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, then genocide, diaspora, and the Republic of Armenia. Obviously, the Soviet period, and then the independence of the Republic of Armenia. Uh, as we can see, the existence of Armenian survivors as citizens of Turkey is completely out of the scope of Armenian historiography. 
When it comes to Turkish historiography, we see, uh, again, <coughs> another set of biases that the following scholars have done a very good job in criticizing nationalist historiography in, uh, in, of Turkey, and the three of them are citizens of Turkey. They are not Armenians or uh, others. So the assumptions in Turkish historiography is the following, that non-Muslims, including Armenians, supported the Russian and European colonialists and the Greek invasion of Anatolia. Armenian victims are just a byproduct of war. The Armenian, i.e., there was no intention to annihilate the, the population. So yes, there are Armenian victims. We feel sorry for them, like what Mr. Erdogan recently told us. He, he feels sorry for the victims, but there was no intent to annihilate, and therefore, it was not a genocide, which is the official uh, stance of the Turkish government. Uh, and that Armenian survivors indicate that there, are, there was no systematic policy of annihilation. So the fact that there are Armenian survivors, it means that, well, we didn't, there was no intention to kill them all. And that uh, Armenians, in fact, have victimized the Turkish nation. So they speak about uh, certain incidents where Armenians have uh, killed Turks and specifically focus on what they call Armenian uh, terrorism as well, which has some truth because there has been some uh, uh, t terrorist attacks by some groups like Asala and elsewhere. So it is not terribly uh, untrue, but the, interest, but the most important thing for us to understand that, these, uh, th that, that uh, they, they manipulate certain facts in order to arrive to the most important goal in, for the Turkish state is to say that whatever happened to Armenian was not intended to be a mass, a mass annihilation, and therefore it is not a genocide. So uh, in both historiographies then, whether it is the Armenian historiography or the Turkish historiography, we find silencing to the presence of uh, uh, Armenians as citizens of Turkey. And it becomes very tricky as well because the f to say that someone have, uh, having an Armenian father or grandfather or a mother, then it means that they are not purely Turks. And this has a stigma. If you may recall that when the, um, uh, Abdullah Gül, when he was president, uh, went to Armenia to attend uh, a, a match, the football match, and, and, and the right-wing nationalist uh, journalist accused him of, of being Armenian or of an Armenian descent. Now, I, recently, I also discovered that where he comes from is a neighborhood that used to be an Armenian village before the genocide. So there might be some truth, but again, there are loads of hidden Armenians in, in, in Turkey. So it has this stigma uh, that comes with it. More generally, recent works of on empires have tended to focus on the non-dominant confessional and ethnic groups that were labeled quote-unquote minorities in the vocabulary of post-imperial governance and in, also in academic studies. In the Ottoman case, the violence against these groups experienced in the late 19th and early 20th century overshadow the long history of coexistence between various groups. Similarly, the anthropology of the Middle East has been critiqued because of the under-representation of intercommunal interactions, mixed populations, and the fact that minorities, especially non-Muslims in the Middle East, are represented as contained in their societies and are treated within the pure view of a single group monographic approaches. And that's why we find a, a lot of studies, whether in anthropology and history, that focus on the Armenians of Istanbul during uh, the 1930s, the Jewish community of Istanbul, the Christians of I don't know which uh, which city, without giving us really how did these communities live with as citizens within the wider, uh, in, in their wider societies. In addition, the critique points to the fact that studies lack convincing explanation of the process that turned confessional communities into ethno-sectarian minority groups, i.e. their racializations. So the minority groups that we have now haven't always existed. So what are the historical, social, and political processes that made these populations into minorities? So I take note of these critiques as I try to map alternative ways of representing populations such as Armenians in the hope to open other venues for the study of similar groups and the entire Middle East and Balkan regions. 
the consequence of construction of state borders and population boundaries through silencing the historical, demographic, and geographic and cultural realities that bleed into each other like the rainbow colors that have existed in much of the region's history due to imperial control and the movement of peoples, goods, and ideas. Such construction of polarized contrasts between intertwined cultures lead to what Fernando Coronil has once described to be as and I quote, exalting their difference, erasing their historical links, and homogenizing their internal features, unwittingly reinscribing an imperial self-other duality, even as it seeks to unsettle colonial representations, unquote. The decolonization of knowledge is therefore a historical project, a project in history and a project of history. Decolonization and equally, denationalization is the work of the radical historian. Such a historian, in the words of Abdurrahman Hussein in his intellectual biography of Edward Said, produces what he call, calls counter histories that subvert received wisdom and are written against the grain of self contained traditions of founding fathers and exclusive canons that flourish on polarized and narcissistic view of the world, the inferiority of an outside, uh, outsider enemy, and the exaggerated importance of one's own nation, group, sect, and tribe. As a post-colonial critic, Edward Said advocates that one should imagine alternative maps that would reveal what he calls overlapping territories and intertwined histories common to men and women, whites and non-whites, dwellers in the metropolis and the peripheries, past as well as present and future." Unquote. The production of counter-histories is therefore central to a critical project that is oppositional in both colonial and nationalist structures that aim at ousting systems of creating hierarchical relations, asserting racial divisions, and moral superiorities of one group over another. In an attempt to re-establish the silenced historical links, avoid propagating the worldviews established in the wake of European colonialism and nationalism, one must appeal to critical historical inquiry uh, where nation states, geopolitical regions, and uh, are problematized and populations are taken out of our intellectual ghettos. Now I explore these two webs of connection between Armenians and Balkan Muslims on one hand and Armenians and Kurds in Anatolia on another. Yeah. Intertwined histories with the Balkans. The decade between the end of the Balkan Wars of 1913 and the establishment of the Republic of Turkey in 1923 witnessed a series of cataclysmic events that would alter the face of the region geographically uh, and demographically. The events are the Armenian Genocide of 1915, the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement that divided the remaining provinces between British and French colonial endeavors, that are currently part of the popular culture right now, as we are witnessing changes in the maps of the Middle East. The Balfour Declaration of 1917, promising southern Syria, to which the British ascribed the biblical name Palestine to in, 1980, in 1881, to the World Zionist Organization, and the exchange of population between Greece and Turkey according to the provisions of the Lausanne Treaty that was signed in 1923. It is notable that all four had significant implications on altering the demographics of different parts of the region based on sectarian divisions. While Sykes-Picot and the Balfour Declaration are often discussed uh, in the making of the modern Middle East, the legacies of the Armenian Genocide and the Lausanne Treaty and their Balkan contexts are largely ignored. I argue that these two are important to situate the drastic changes that put an end to the demographic diversity and coexistence between various ethnic and religious communities in the, in, in the post-Ottoman space. The late Ottoman Empire, particularly the Balkans and the Anatolian provinces, were a laboratory of demographic engineering, writes the historian Eric Zürcher. 
The demographic movement forced migration, expulsion, massacres in the Balkans between 1860 and 1960 had important effects on the making of Turkey and subsequently the Middle East. By the time the, word, the first world war erupted in, uh, on August 2nd, 1914, the Ottoman Empire had lost all of its Balkan provinces, Egypt and North Africa. The empire consisted of what is now Turkey, Iraq, geographic Syria, or Bilad al-Sham, and the eastern and western coasts of the Arabian Peninsula. Following the start of the war, these last remaining Ottoman provinces became a target of competing European colonial interests and local nationalist movements that created nations and constructed borders for the newly imagined political entities. Now I focus on the two ignored events as or events or processes, which are, uh, and I call them processes and not events because they did not end when the event actually ended. But they, they, we, we, we still are in the shadow of the Lausanne Treaty and whenever anything happens in Turkey, they're, they're, the, the media, whether left or right or nationalist or non-nationalist or Islamist, have, they all have to go back to the Lausanne Treaty. So it is, and of course the Treaty of Sever, that's another issue that we can discuss. Now I focus on the two ignored events or processes which are the Balkan, uh, the context of both the Armenian Genocide and the Lausanne Treaty, uh, so as to understand why people like Mehran had to leave his town in the wake of the arrival of Balkan war refugees uh, to uh, Anatolia. The independence of the Balkan Ottoman provinces as Christian majority ethno-sectarian states affected the status of non-Muslim non -Muslim citizens of Turkey. And here, I'm, when I speak about the non-Muslims in Turkey, referring to the Jewish population, the Armenians, the Roman Orthodox, that a lot of people refer to them as Greek Orthodox. It's wrong. Never use Greek Orthodox. And Syriacs of Anatolia. As non-Muslims, these communities were racialized and turned into minorities as non-Turks, and the Turkish nationalists perceived their existence as potential reason for Europeans to intervene in the empire's affairs. But more importantly, Eric Zürker argues that the Turkish nationalists regarded the Armenians as a threat, assuming that if they were to achieve national sovereignty in Anatolia, following the example of the Balkan Christian states, they would have posed a threat to the Muslim population in Anatolia, which was basically the Ottoman heartland. Consequently, the young Turk government wanted to solve, quote unquote, the European claims to Ottoman, to Ottoman territory that is known as the Eastern question in European diplomatic uh, uh, circles by exterminating the Armenian population in Anatolia during the First World War. Uh, world War. The annihilation of Armenians, therefore, needs to be understood against the ba background of the Balkan Wars when the Ottoman Empire lost important European provinces. It has been stated as many as 5.5 million Muslims were driven out of Europe and 5 million were killed or died while fleeing between 1821 and 1923 a period that began with the Greek and Serbian independence from the Ottoman Empire and culminated with the Turkish War of Independence and the establishment of the Republic in 1923. It is this chapter of history that gets silenced by many when they speak about the Armenian Genocide and the Turkish state plays the same game by highlighting, thinking that by highlighting uh, the Balkan uh, Muslim uh, victims, they somehow they subvert or deny the Armenian genocide. So there is always, in every academic conference I attend, those who speak about the Armenian genocide do not speak about the Balkans, and those who want to deny the genocide focus only on the Balkans. It is thus imp very important to read them contrapuntally and juxtapose both uh, as uh, part of the same context in the rise of nationalism in the late Ottoman Empire. In this environment, the young Turks the ruling elites of the empire during World War I were key players. A disproportionate number of them, of the Turkish nationalists, by the way, were Balkan Muslims who received European education in Ottoman institutions, who had lost their homeland upon the creation of ethno-sectarian polities uh, with Orthodox Christian national identities in the Balkans. In that sense, uh, Eric Zürker also says, 
he said, European Muslims created Turkey. Other scholars, such as Umit Ungur, have described the young Turk leadership as traumatized and committed to launching a violent project of societal transformation in order to secure a Turkish nation state. The Young Turks policies thus took place in the ethnically heterogeneous Ottoman eastern provinces of Anatolia, which had also a significant portion of the Ottoman Armenian population. In the dark side of democracy, Michael Mann situates genocide and ethnic cleansing in European modernity. The, the perpetrators of the genocide were not the terrible Turks or alien Asiatics, as Europeans used to describe the, ru the rulers of the Ottoman Empire. They were secular, European-born, European-educated Turkish nationalists fighting to establish a nation state following European models of modernity, including secularism. In fact, France played an important uh, uh, role in imagining for the Turkish nationalists as they imagine their, uh, the, the, the model of uh, the Republic of Turkey. In the imagination of the founding elites of, uh, of Turkey, Anatolia was a substitute for the lost homelands in the Balkans, and Muslims were a substitute for the Armenians in Anatolia. Although Anatolia was a foreign country to them at the time, the terrain was constructed as compensation for the lost homelands in the European Ottoman provinces. Throughout the 20th century, as we heard from Mehran earlier, Anatolia would continue to host many expelled and massacred Muslims such as Bosnians, Bulgarians, and Crimean Tatars from uh, the Balkans, the Russian Empire, and the Soviet Union. As Muslims from ex-Ottoman territories, they were then received and assimilated within Turkish majoritarianism of the state, while the Armenians who are natives to Anatolia were racialized as foreign, non-Turkish population and rendered a statistical minority. Even actually in some documents I've, I was looking at, they refer to uh, Armenians in Turkish as the yerli yabanjiler, which in, in Turkish means the local foreigners. So, so they are foreigners, but they came from nowhere, so they are local foreigners. So let us look at the details of this process of creating a majority. It is not only minorities that deserve our attention, rather the ways in which a majority was created in post-imperial polities. After all, minorities do assume the existence of a majority. No, it's fine. Oh, actually, yeah, more. Next one, yeah. Oh, no. We'll go back, yeah. On uh, 28th of January, 1920, during the last session of the Ottoman Parliament, the parliamentarians defined Turkey, or what to become Turkey, as a state of Ottoman Muslims, or to be accurate, as an ethno-sectarian, secular Muslim state. Yeah, it's, I mean, we, can, we can discuss this later, but it's, it's, it's interesting. And that's why, by the way, when, when in the last couple of years during the uprising in Egypt, when people were speaking about the, you know, the Turkish model, I mean, I, I don't know what Turkish model they were talking about, but... During this session, uh, the Ottoman parliamentarians, who included the members of the Ankara government led by Mustafa Kemal, who was later called himself Atatürk, consolidated what is called the Misaki Milli, or the national pact that defined the territories that would become Turkey in terms of ethno-sectarian categories of the Ottoman population. Article 1 of the pact states the following. The territories inhabited by an Ottoman Muslim majority united in religion, race, and aim formed an indivisible whole. But the fate of the territories inhabited by an Arab majority which were under foreign occupation the British and the French, should be determined by plebiscite." Unquote. So it is notable that it, the, the National Pact did not advocate for a, national, for a Turkish national sovereignty, rather an Ottoman Muslim one, following the Ottoman practice that those who belong to uh, uh, the Sunni Islam are the ruling sect, or known in Turkey, uh, Ottoman Turkish as the, the Arabic Milleti Hakime, the ruling uh, sect of the empire. And here I say Sunni Muslim because the non-Sunni Muslims were not allowed to be recognized as a millet. Only non-Muslims can be divided into uh, Armenian, Orthodox, uh, Syriacs, uh, Jews, and, and so on. 
This fact meant that the pact's authors turned the diverse Muslim ethno-linguistic and sectarian groups such as Kurds, Alavis, Turks, and others, with the exceptions of the Arabs, into a majority that would later be forced to assimilate into a Turkish ethno-sectarian state. This definition was, was asserted by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk himself in many of his speeches in the 1920s, where he emphasized that when he emphasized the Muslim character of the nation. In one of his speeches, he says, and I, he said, and I, I quote, "The nation that we are here to preserve and defend is, of course, not only comprised of one element, i.e., only the Turks." It is composed of various Muslim elements, and in the speech he speaks about the Laz, the Sherkes, the Kurds, the Alevis, etc. Following the example of the Balkan ethno-sectarian states, Turkish nationalists made adherence to Islam as a marker of Turkishness. But of course, the secular aspect to it said that those Muslims shouldn't be uh, involved in religion and politics and shouldn't practice in public. So this is where the the a religion becomes an ethnic marker rather than a, um, a, a, a force in governance. The annihilation of the Armenian population and forced exchange of the Roman Orthodox Christians that are known as Greeks with Muslims of Greece were two critical events that contributed to the re realization of the image of Turkey as an ethno-sectarian state for the non-Arabic speaking Ottoman Muslims. Now we turn to the Lausanne Treaty, which was uh, a, a, an intellectual obsession for me for two, three years. The Lausanne Treaty, following the Armenian genocide and the end of the war, the Greco-Turkish a treaty that was negotiated and signed in Lausanne was yet another critical event for ra racializing and altering the demographics of what was to become Turkey and the Middle East. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> After the defeat of the Greek campaign in Anatolia by the Turkish forces led by Mustafa Kemal, Turkey negotiated the peace treaty with Greece under the auspices of Britain and France. Well, who else? The Lausanne Treaty provided grants for the first large-scale ethnic cleansing in, in the international legal system. And I say it's ethnic cleansing because this population was, uh, had, was forced migration. They were not given the choice to leave or not leave. So on, by definition, it's a treaty of ethnic cleansing. Under the treaty, as many as 350,000 Muslims, many of whom were Greek speakers, were forced into Turkey as Turks, simply because they were Muslims. And around 1.2 million Orthodox Christians, many of whom were Turkish speakers, were forced into Greece, which by the population of Greece at the time was 4.5 million. And they received 1.2 million uh, Anatolian uh, refugees. <clears throat> so the Orthodox were treated as Greeks simply because they belonged to the Orthodox faith. The criteria of exchange was were largely sectarian, language and cultural affiliations were hardly a factor in the final outcome of the treaty. But how is this then related to the Armenians? Turkish and British diplomatic documents that I worked with reveal that what is silenced from the final text of the Lausanne Treaty and historiography is the centrality of the Armenian question uh, uh, in the negotiations of the Lausanne Treaty. The Armenian question has uh, largely been ignored in assessments of the final text of the treaty and until recently in many subsequent historical and academic stud studies on the Armenian citizens of Turkey as well as the histories that are written on uh, the Lausanne Treaty itself. And it was very interesting because the, the Turkish delegation was never, uh, the Armenian delegation was never allowed to represent itself in, in, the, in, the, in the conference. And they were leaving uh, notes for Ismet Inunu, the head of the Turkish delegation. They were staying all in the same hotel. So they would write notes and put it on Ismet Inunu's uh, hotel room in order to communicate things with him. What I want to highlight here is the centrality of the Balkan Muslim in determining also the fate of Armenians. The Turkish delegation repeatedly protested the inclusion of the Armenian representative in the minorities subcommission. Nevertheless, the European allies tried to bring the Armenian and Bulgarian representatives to present their cases in front of the delegates.
Reza Noor, who was a member of the Turkish delegation, sent a warning to the subcommission, as well as Ismet Pasha, uh, the head of the, of the delegation, uh, sent to the president of the conference arguing the following, and I quote, as the Armenian representative cannot be delegated to represent the Armenian government, while we will strongly protest the acceptance of Armenians as one of the minorities of Turkey. At the same time, if all the Muslim minorities of Romania, Serbia and Greece are included in the sessions, only then we will accept to listen to the Armenian representative. So basically, why, are you, why do you want us to listen to the Armenian and you don't want to listen to the Muslim minorities in the Balkans? In the warning which we have given to the Commission, we also emphasized the inclusion of the Irish representative. Okay, and of course, unquote. Now, of course, the Irish question, basically, uh, Ismet Pasha was saying that if you, are, if you want to deal with our minorities, then why don't we deal also with your minorities? Right? But of course, the, the, the colonial uh, atmosphere of the, of, the, of the time said that as the, the Britain and France were the victors during World War I, they can then uh, put pressure on the losers of the war, uh, especially Turkey, uh, on using the minority question, while Turkey cannot bring the question of, of minorities. So basically, the British, the, the French, the British, the French, and the Americans were not advocating for the inclusion of the Armenians for the sake of justice, but just to use the Armenians as a file to put pressure on uh, on punishing Turkey. So I, I find it's, it's very important to think of the intentions behind things. The British vetoed the inclusion of the Irish delegation, obviously, at the conference, and the Turkish delegation had, as the Turkish delegation had requested, the suggestion that an Irish representative should attend, coupled with the refusal of the Turkish delegation to allow Armenians, led Lord Curzon, the head of the British delegation, to end the debate on the topic and stop advocating for the inclusion of the Armenian representative. And I think what Ismet Ininu said, I think that was the only thing that I agreed with the Turkish delegation in Lausanne. He had a point. The Armenians who remained in Turkey after the conclusion of the conference started to be governed according to a treaty negotiated by the Greek and Turkish states, each of which sought to defend its respective ethno-sectarian minority retained within the borders of the other state. The Armenians who were not allowed to have a representative in the official proceedings to advocate for their loss of lives and properties in Anatolia had no say in the future in the newly founded state that began to govern them. And by the way, the Armenian delegation in Lausanne was headed by, the, uh, by an Armenian who was, until the genocide, was the foreign minister of the Ottoman Empire. The treaty had three implications for Turkey, the Balkans, and the Middle East. First, it contributed to, to racializing the Ottoman populations based on sectarian lines, turning the diverse Ottoman Muslims into, quote unquote, Turks. Until then, a Turk was basically an uneducated Anatolian villager who spoke, didn't speak proper Turkish or knew any foreign languages, like Redneck. To this end, the Turkish delegation at the conference pre uh, prevented the diverse Muslim population in Anatolia, such as Kurds, Alavis, Laz, and Sherkes, Circassians, from being racialized and recognized in the international system as minorities because they were made to constitute the demographic majority of the newly founded Turkish states. The memoirs of Reza Nur, that, which were actually interesting, show how adamant the Turkish delegation uh, was on not to recognize. So the French said, well, why are are you only recognizing the, the Armenians and the, and the Orthodox as minorities? Why don't you also recognize the Kurds and the Alavis and the others as also a minority? And Reza Noor writes in, the, in, in his memoir, he said, they, of course, he, uh, Ataturk ended up, uh, you know, uh, like not giving him, I mean, they, they had a fight after, after the treaty. So he wrote the memoir in a way to show how he contributed to uh, the foundation of the, of the Turkish Republic. So he said, and luckily I was able to succeed uh, to, pre to prevent the, the recognition of the, of the Muslim population from minorities. They wanted to scatter us like cotton, he said. 
If they were divided, if the Muslim population in Anatolia were to be divided on ethnic and sectarian terms like non-Muslims, uh, it would have been hard for the Turkish delegation to argue that it was a representative of a majority on the territory that would, ha would, that would become the Republic of Turkey. Turkey did not have Turks. The category had to be invented, and the majority had to be made. And subsequently, those who were non-Muslim, i.e. non-Turks, were minorities. And this is where majoritarianism deserves more attention because the exclusion of minorities are only a byproduct of majoritarian rule. The residual non-Muslim population in Turkey, the Armenians, the Roman Orthodox, and the Jews, were consequently prevented from becoming full Turkish citizens because their sectarian affiliation rendered them non-Turks. Kurds, on the other hand, and this is where the Kurdish question is very, a very interesting counterpoint, on the other hand, were forced into Turkish majoritarian culture because, they, because as Muslims, they had no right or interna international legal protection to maintain their uh, uh, ethnic or linguistic specificity within the Republic of Turkey. The second implication of the treaty was establishing ethnic cleansing as a legal solution in international conflicts through treaties that allow involuntary expulsions of unwanted populations. And from that aspect, I call it ethnic cleansing. And here I give two examples that use the Lausanne Treaty as a model. The Zionist movement also discussed the model of the Lausanne Treaty, whereby Jews from Arab states would replace majoritarian uh, uh, Jewish ethno-sectarian state as per the recommendation of the Peel Commission that took place in 1936-1937. The second example, which is very interesting, that it's not from the Middle East or the, or the Balkans, but India, where 11 million uh, which is the largest uh, expulsion leg in, 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 a legal, uh, in a legal treaty, the largest expulsion in history, where 11 million uh, Muslims and Hindus had to cross the India-Pakistan uh, border. Yes, okay. Now, the overlapping territories with the Kurds. While Mehran pointed to the effect of resettlement of Balkan Muslims in Anatolia, the predicament of many other Armenians in, in the southeastern provinces were connected to that of the Kurds. In the Kurdish areas, tension over land and the abduction of Armenian women influenced the way Armenians lived as Turkish citizens. For example, Aras family experienced the following, and I quote, Back in 1954, an Armenian girl from the village related to the family was kidnapped by the Kurds for marriage. And uh, Ara comes from uh, a village uh, very uh, close to the city of Kayseri. These kidnappings were common. My uncle Harut fought to bring back the abducted girl and he ended up killing the man who kidnapped her and brought back the girl to the family. After this incident, the Ara, the, Turkey, the village head, told him, your safety cannot be guaranteed and all the family had to leave. So my father and the rest of the family moved to Ankara for a while as we had some relatives, then to Istanbul. Shortly afterwards, I was born in Istanbul. That was 1955. And it's very interesting that both Mihran and Ara left Anatolia in the decade of the 1950. And, and this is when really the Armenian population started to immigrate from, from uh, uh, Anatolia to Istanbul. And at the time, also the Armenian Patriarchate in Istanbul was sending priests in, in search for Armenian kids, basically, and Armenian families, sometimes to baptize them, uh, do some uh, funerary prayers on the dead, or, or marry them. There are sto lots of stories about the traveling Armenian priests in the 1950s in Anatolia. The stories around abducting Armenian women for marriage frequently emerged during my fieldwork among Armenians who had left Anatolia after the foundation of the Republic. They draw attention to the ways in which uh, power dynamics shifted after the First World War between Kurds and Armenians, both as suppressed communities under the Turkish state. And the ways Armenians experienced this in their everyday encounters with Kurds. While violence against Armenians existed in the late Ottoman period, kidnapping of Armenians in Anatolia intensified for reasons such as the dispersal and weakening of the Armenian social networks 
uh, after the genocide, leaving Armenian women vulnerable. This is manifested in Ara's story when the family had to leave because his uncle challenged the abduction of a family member. Yet the fear of being kidnapped also instigated migration, as is the case with Bahri. Natives of Sasun, the members of Bahri's family survived the genocide when the Aha, the landlord, and his family protected them. They became part of the Kurdish Ashiret, or the tribal structure, where loyalty to the landlord is expected. She says, after 1915, Armenians belonged to whomever had saved them during the genocide. They became our owners. And it's very interesting because when she was speaking in Turkish to me, she used the word, uh, which is Arabic, she used the word sahib, like basically she spoke that we became, uh, they owned us. Bahri explained, such ownership meant that loyalty and obedience, especially in matters of marriage, alliances, the naming of a newly born Armenian, ch uh, uh, Armenian child, and, whatever the, and whether this child is going to be registered as Muslim or Armenian in the official birth certificate, this is up to the discretion of the landlord. Despite their good relations with the uh, when her father died in 1972, Bahri and her mother moved to Istanbul. As two Armenian women, Bahri stated with regret, we became vulnerable to kidnapping. While Bahri was not kidnapped, albeit some female relatives were, and kidnapping became a haunting fear of women of a certain age and their family, regardless of whether it, it, it occurs or not. The Kurdish and Armenian predicaments continue to be intertwined. Following the 1925 Kurdish revolt of Sheikh Said, and it's very interesting because the Kurdish revolt against the Turkish state started less than two years of signing of the Lausanne Treaty, because they were pro promised to be included in the Turkish state and only to discover that they cannot be part of the Turkish state as Kurds. They had to be Turkified. Uh, the Turkish state issued the Iskan Kanunu, or the, settlement, the forced settlement law, to resettle Kurds around the country, so as to decrease their concentration in the southeastern provinces. Through this forced internal migration, the Turkish state treated Armenians as Kurds. Bahri explains, I quote, In 1938, my family was asked to leave to Iz for Izmir. So, members of, the, of, of her family ended up in Izmir and other, other cities around Turkey. So basically even, so one tribe or one family or members of one village couldn't be moved to other parts of Turkey as a whole. They were fragmenting them. Between 1938 and 1948, there were forced migration of Kurds in areas where there had been rebellions. These policies also influenced us as Armenians, who were adopted by Kurdish landlords. While in Izmir, my family was not revealing their identity because they were considered Kurds. When I asked them if they, had, if they revealed their identity, they replied, are you crazy? We saw what happened to those who revealed it. They were pelted with stones. Unquote. The efforts of Bahri's parents to hide their Armenian identity is not uncommon in post-Ottoman Turkish Anatolia due to the self-imposed sanctions about their, the past experiences of Armenians during the genocide and their very presence in Turkey. While there have been plethora of work that brings to the surface the sanctioned past of Armenians in Anatolia, I want to highlight one ethnography uh, by Zerrin Biner that speaks well to my ethnography by showing the complexity of doing uh, ethnographic and historical work on, uh, on the Armenians who remained in Anatolia and also the intertwined histories between Kurds and Armenians. When Biner st started her fieldwork in the south South, southern Anatolian city of Mardin, she did not question her informants about the 1915 genocide, and people generally did not discuss it. Knowledge about this past, how, however, was present in the silence of people about it. Information started to erupt during her stay with a family when one of Biner's informants, she named her uh, Nazire, was surprised that Biner was not asking questions about the Armenian issues. So, so she told her, oh, you're not here to, to know about the Armenian issue? 
and then volunteered information about the local Armenian past of Mardin. After a few meetings, Nazira revealed the secret that everyone shared in Mardin, but no one talks about publicly, that there is an Armenianness rooted in the origin of every Kurd. In every house, there is an Armenian no one knows, and this included Nazira's own uncle's wife. So Ara and Bahri stories, as well as Biner's work, testify to the many ways in which Armenians and Kurds have a common geography, intertwined history, and share kinship networks. The geographies of Kurdistan and Western Armenia, which is Anatolia, overlap. Kurds both participated in the Armenian genocide as well as helped Armenian survive. So every Armenian survivor was, was able to survive because a Turk or a Kurd or, or some of the Bedouins in the Syrian desert helped them to survive. Sometimes out of goodwill, sometimes abducting Armenian uh, women, sometimes for rape, whatever the reason, but they survived by the population that helped them to survive. And many Armenians who remained in Anatolia by converting to Islam became wives and mothers to a new generation of Kurds in southeastern Anatolia. Yet now they were struggling against the Turkish state's effort to erase their Kurdishness in the process of Turkifying the people and land of Turkey. So first they had to deal with the Armenian genocide and being Armenian survivors. And when that finished, they started to uh, deal with the discrimination against the Kurdish population that until recently the Turkish state called the Mountain Turks. Some concluding remarks, just another five minutes. In this talk, I have demonstrated the ways in which racialization and the creation of minorities and majorities occurred in some successor states of the Ottoman Empire. Situating Anatolian Armenians as an ethnographic perspective opens a venue for understanding the predicament of other populations such as the Balkan Muslims and the Anatolian Kurds in Turkey. By juxtaposing the multiple victimhood of different groups, we contextualize the demographic ramification of post-imperial nationalist states that have been obscured by academic and political discourses. In this sense, such a a perspective not only tells us about the marginal populations, uh, such the, as the Armenians, but sheds new light on the formation of a center and a majority that engendered multiple layered systems of exclusion. The Republic of Turkey was fashioned on the image of Greece and other Balkan Christian states and based its understanding of citizenship on sectarian affiliation to Sunni Islam. In other words, not in terms of a political allegiance or, and governance, but Islam became an ethnic marker. As a result, on the eve of World War I, 20% of the area's uh, population that later became Turkey was Christian. After the massacre of close to a million Ottoman Armenians, the deportation of other Armenians to France after the Ankara Treaty of 1921, and finally exchanging 1.2 million Orthodox for the Muslims in Greece, the Christian population dropped to 1 in 40. So basically from 20% to 2.5% uh, in less than two years, uh, uh, less than 10 years. On the other side of the Europe-Middle East divide, the Muslim population of the Balkans shared a common predicament, yet they continue to be understudied and underrepresented and subverted between the discourses of Islamophobia in Europe and the discrimination faced by Christians in the Middle East. Further, actually, when you compare the number of studies or articles or books written on the experience of Balkan Muslims during the war, they are very, very few compared to the works done on uh, the Christians of the Middle East. Furthermore, the fact that the Turkish state continues to deny the Armenian genocide by using the suffering experienced by Bal Balkan Muslims has hindered the recognition of suffering among the various uh, populations in this post-imperial nationalist setting. And for this reason, I have chosen uh, this picture that I took myself in, in Diyarbakir, this is the, 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 the walls of the city. The city is built by basalt, uh, so and hence the dark stones. And 
uh, this is a Kurdish child that you find a lot of uh, street children, uh, Kurdish street children in Diyarbakir. And I thought that, I mean, he could also be Armenian or half Armenian or... So I chose him to, uh, to be a poster for this lecture, particularly to uh, emphasize the importance of this intertwined histories between Kurds and, and Armenians. Recent works on empires have tended to focus on the non-dominant confessional and ethnic groups, consequently discrimination against Muslim groups who do not affiliate with the Sunni sect is rendered unworthy of examination because religious minorities continue to be defined by the Ottoman millet structure where the designation of minorities is applied only to non-Muslim populations, while the diversity of sects within Islam are not permitted to be classified as such. That, of course, except in Lebanon. Therefore, historians and anthropologists should move beyond the state of affairs in their analysis to include Shia Muslims in the Gulf monarchical states and Egypt, the Alevis in Turkey, the Druze in Lebanon, without secluding them from the wider social and political contexts of their own societies. Ottoman Armenians, as an ethnographic perspective, allow for a situated and contextual examination of other marginal communities in post-Ottoman space to recognize that majoritarian polities have many layers of victimhood. One is due to the recognition of minority, so discrimination happens because the person, the group is recognized as a minority, such as Armenians, and the second because they are denied the recognition, such as the Alavis and the Kurds in Turkey. Probing into the ways in which populations that are affected during the process of majoritarian pol pol uh, polity formation is as important as looking at, at the exclusion of minorities and their rights. It is thus imperative for ethnographers and historians to avoid blind spots so, such as those that arise from favoring some victim population. They ignore other victims that lurk underneath the seemingly homogeneous majoritarianism. So basically, now you know when Turkey says, well, 98% of the population is Turkish Muslim. And Greece says, 98% of Greece is Orthodox Christian. Okay, but you, you see where the other groups that are, well, first of all, there, this was only possible through ethnic cleansing and state homogenization. So the, 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 there is the, this uh, clear cut uh, uh, appeal of, of, of the 98% of, of the major, majority. To challenge the state-centered categories of minorities and majorities, one must move in oppositional tracks between sites, categories, and borders, and renegotiate identities imposed by colonial and nationalist regimes. The production of such knowledge aims to open up new, new horizons for solidarity in politics and shared conversations in epistemology. Uh, as Donna Haraway says, because the inclusion of the subjugated groups leads to what Haraway says, more adequate, sustained, objective, transforming accounts of the world. Unquote. and not merely of the regions and populations I discuss today. Furthermore, the study of marginal groups not only reveal important and subtle ethnographic nuances about the population under study, but also opens up new venues to understand the center from the vantage point of the margin. Such a perspective compels us to think critically about the established ethnic categories and the ways in which such categories influence ethnographic perceptions and the production of historical knowledge, because it opens a space to go beyond the invented traditions of enmity between these categories to avoid homogenizing victims and victimizers in a black-white di uh, black dichotomy. So Anatolian Turks and Kurds also saved Armenians, as I show uh, uh, elsewhere, Armenian institutions in Istanbul con also contributed to the forced migration of Armenians from Anatolia, and the Armenian diaspora institution have sought to homogenize and limit being an Armenian to the genocide experience. So we cannot really divide the world in black and white dichotomies. This commitment is essential for composing historical and ethnographic texts, as well as significant politically, since it uncovers ideologies behind the representation of the past for current political agendas. 
Any act of representation has political ramifications. Following Frantz Fanon's commitment to the importance of liberating both the colonizer and the colonized from their violent history, I believe that unearthing the many strata of victimhood and exclusion means imagining a more inclusive and humane future that transcends the binaries of majorities versus minorities, victims versus victimizers. I believe and hope that historians and anthropologists, through the very act of oppositional modes of representation, are in a position to contribute to such good endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hakem. That was uh, very, very interesting. I would like also to welcome Monsignor Kriko Kusa, uh, Bishop of the um, Catholic Armenian Church, uh, who is uh, honoring us by his presence. So thank you very much. Um, wow. <laughs> so that was really very dense. Uh, and I'm sure um, all of you I think it was so dense that we could all find something really interesting and something to focus on. I personally really like this idea of rigidity and inclusion and inclusion, exclusions, and, and how you started with the uh, Middle East versus the Balkan. They are two like supposedly very different areas and, and completely uh, like rigid and, and we are when they are completely constructed as well and then the same thing happens with with categories and majority and minorities and how they can appear and disappear and there is this sort of like blending within these uh, categories and, and they all disappear and, and I couldn't help thinking although it's slightly different but I've been working a lot on the um, census American census and how within the majority and the minority there's very similar uh, sort of like uh, processes you know the, the the white categories are white and there is no sort of distinction so so it's, it's fascinating uh, because you give us a lot of insight on uh, um, Armenian history, but more general insight on constructs and rigidification of categories and, and maps and, and borders. So, thank you so much. Now, I would like to open the floor to uh, all of you with all your questions. So, just one quick um, uh, logistic um, uh, question. I think we will take questions three by three, so we will ask, uh, you can raise your hand and then uh, the microphone will be brought to you and then you can ask your question. Please introduce yourself before you ask your question. Uh, make sure that your question is clear and uh, not too long uh, and easy, of course. Uh, I think you can ask him a couple of very hard questions, that's fine. Uh, but, but short and, and to the point. So please, let's go. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. By the, by the way, I, dis, I discovered that I'm white in the U.S. because Middle Easterners are white. White, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, do, you have, do, do we have microphones? Yeah. Okay, please. Um, sorry if I go first. I actually have uh, two questions. Uh, can, I, can, I get, can I get away with that? Yes. Uh, you, you, you didn't talk about the situation of the Armenians in places like Aleppo, which was also also very heavily Turkified there under the Ottoman influence at that time, and had a different experience, or maybe partly a different experience. Maybe you could, could would that make a difference in how you analyze these things? And the second question is, was any consideration given to uh, analyzing people by language rather than, rather than, than by religion? Thank you for this. Yes. Uh, I also have two questions. Okay. Don't forget to introduce yourself. My name is Osama El Ghazali. I'm a journalist. Uh, I've heard about an organization which was named Tashkilati Mahsusa. How far was this organization involved in the violence against the Armenians? Because, as you know, uh, some of the important leaders of that organization played an important role in the, in the history of Egypt, Abdul Rahman Azam Basha, Muhammad Saleh Harb, etc. This is the first question. Second question, why doesn't anyone say anything about the fact that the perpetrators of these atrocities 
were uh, tried and punished. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Imad Aisha. I used to be a professor. I'm a journalist now. Um, I want to, well, something close to what uh, uh, um, Samuel was asking. I want to kind of Egyptianize this. If, if, if secularism is just a, a veneer for ethnic religious identities, then what hope is there? <laughs> you either have what left. If, if secularism is just a veneer for ethnic, or it creates ethnic, worse than that, or ethnic religious identities that didn't exist in the past, what hope is there? Either you have the Khilafa on the model of Daesh, or you have secularism on the model of Bashar al-Assad, which is really sectarianism. Uh, the other thing is um, um, this whole thing of, well, minority, majority, you have to have an enemy, you have to have a foreign enemy. Uh, and uh, what, what are your opinions on what just happened recently to the Armenian belly dancer Safinar and the whole thing about the, the um, Egyptian flag thing she was wearing? <laughs> if she was an Egyptian who did that, would any of, anyone have even noticed? <laughs> That's okay. a good question. I think if pure the Egyptian women should answer this, not me. Well, thank you for these questions. I'll, I'll try to uh, tackle them as much as possible. Uh, the Armenians of Aleppo, uh, they, the Armenians of Aleppo, well, also, obviously Aleppo had Armenian uh, population before the genocide, obviously, and a lot of Armenian refugees arrived uh, during the genocide, and they continued leaving Turkey uh, throughout the Republican history, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. So there was this uh, 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 exodus out of Anatolia of whatever Armenians remained, whether to Syria and Turkey. And Syria, I think, until the 1940s had an open border, as far as I, I remember, and also to Istanbul. Uh, I personally, in my research, I focused on the, those who remained in Anatolia because the, of that interesting research question that I was thinking of. Uh, how could a population continue to live as citizens of a state that once sought their annihilation? Uh, so it would have been a, a, a diff very much different in Aleppo because uh, 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 Syria still remain, uh, had a lot of the Syria and Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. Well, there was no Lebanon then. So Syria and, and Iraq uh, hosted a lot of the refugees uh, from from Turkey and maintained until recently uh, the Ottoman diversity of uh, of uh, of population. Now, whether in, in a sectarian system or the uh, I mean, it's, these are not perfect systems, but at least you can you can still walk in in, in Aleppo until what 2010, and hear uh, Turkmen and Armenian and Syriacs and Kurds uh, speak in the in the old market, which is something that wouldn't be possible in a lot of uh, Turkish states because it didn't have this uh, grand nationalism project, successful project as as the Turkish uh, as the Turkish model. Uh, the question on language, uh, it, this is a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up. In the Lausanne Treaty, the, the, there were 100, around 120,000 uh, Turkish-speaking Orthodox Christians in central Anatolia, especially around the, in the province of Kayseri. They are called the Karamanli Orthodox population. They did their prayers, their book of prayers, their, their liturgy, in con completely in, uh, in Turkish, written in uh, Greek script. But instead of using a lot of theological terms in, uh, in, in Greek, they used theological terms in Arabic, which is a very, very interesting. I saw some of those texts, and they are f uh, fascinating. And the Turkish delegation did not want to expel them because they, they didn't think that the Turkish-speaking Orthodox are, are going to uh, uh, ask for independence or fight the Turks. They wanted to expel the, the Greek-speaking Orthodox population of Istanbul with the Orthodox Patriarchate. So this was discussed. But the British and the French told the Turkish delegation, we cannot announce to the world the expulsion of the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. You know, the world opinion would have gone against them. They were supposedly the, the protectors of the Christians of the Middle East, right? So then the, the, the discussion went, okay, we're going to retain 120,000 
or 110,000 Greek-speaking Orthodox Christians in Istanbul with the Patriarchate, and the two little islands, Imbros and Tenedos, that lead to the Straits. And on the other side in Greece, they retained 110, 120,000 uh, Muslims to be citizens of Greece. Uh, that the, in, in Greece they call them uh, the Turkish minority, and the Orthodox in Turkey are called the Greek minority. So it was discussed, but it was not successful because of logistical, I think, because of the importance of, the, of Constantinople in the, for the Orthodox Church and also in the Greek nationalist imagination and the imperial powers who were uh, putting pressure on, on Turkey as the protectors of the Christians of the Middle East. Uh, the Maksusa, yes, the Tashkilati Maksusa were, I'm not actually familiar about the, uh, Egyptian, the Egyptian context, so I cannot, I cannot address that. But they were the group within the Young Turk movement that was responsible for uh, the Armenian no. uh, genocide. Uh, and thus, yes, there was this a good point that there was a, a trials of some of the genocide uh, perpetrators by a Turkish uh, court. But at the same time, there is also ambiguity around, uh, around the Young Turk movement. Okay? So, and this is because a lot of the elites of the Young Turks, some of them were part of the Tashkilati Maksusa that called for the annihilation of Armenians, also ended up being the elites of the Turkish state when it was founded. So there was this, uh, the, uh, basically, conflict in, in, in a way. Now, uh, the, a lot of the critical historians do not draw the line uh, of 1923, the establishment of the Republic of Turkey, as, uh, as, as the rupture from the Ottoman period. They periodize uh, 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 late Ottoman history and Turkish history from the, uh, they call it from 1908 with the Young Turk Revolution that, uh, that wanted it was, it was a good revolution because it wanted equal uh, citizenship for all Ottoman citizens regard, regardless of the sect and the Young Turks Revolution in 1908 had Armenians part of it just for the first 12 months in 1909, they start, the, there was the massacres of Armenians in Adana. Uh, but it was a, a call basically for a, an equal citizenship, uh, citizenship right. So the historians, including Eric Zürcher that I quoted, who is a specialist in that transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic period, he calls from 1908 until 1950, they call that the Young Turk period. So, he doesn't look at 1923 as a critical event in terms of the transformation because the Young Turks were the de facto rulers of the empire uh, from uh, during World War I. So there were two governments at the time. There was the Istanbul government with the Sultan and there was the Ankara government led by the Young Turks. Uh, the, the question of, well, if secularism, I mean, this is, I think, uh, I don't know where to go from that with, with that question. So, if secularism is uh, is bad, nationalism is bad. So, what do we stand on? Right? I, mean, I I don't know. I think we need to ask a political philosopher. But as a lot of the the, the political models that we have in the world, we can uh, it, that we don't have to follow a particular model. We can invent another model. And a lot of a lot of uh, critical uh, uh, intellectuals and politicians in Israel Palestine are thinking of alternatives to partition, which is basically going beyond the idea of of a two state or getting uh, moving towards. Uh, dismantling the apartheid regime, one citizen, one country, uh, basically, uh, basically system. And I mean, if we look at then what would the communal identity be based on, we need to think of a model like Canada, how Canada with the multicultural uh, system have created a national identity, particularly based on the fact that no one belongs to the land but Everyone belongs to the land because of that multicultural aspect. But I'm, again, very critical of that because Canada, like the US and Australia, New Zealand, and Israel and South Africa, are settler colonial states. So, where does this lead us with the native question as well? Uh, because these countries were built uh, on the annihilation of the native population. 
but I don't have an answer of one, what would be a good political system over another, but I think we need to continuously to struggle of more inclusive uh, systems and uh, on, on a wider communal level, and on a personal level, we need to move from the dichotomy into a more, more compassionate uh, hearts and minds. Thank you, um, Hekim, for uh, that was really a brilliant lecture, and um, I appreciated it very much. Um, two questions also. Um, one that was raised actually yesterday um, that I couldn't, didn't have an answer to. Tana Aksham argues that, and, and I think you've sort of echoed this, uh, that the um, genocide um, of the Armenians was part of a larger a process of homogenizing uh, Anatolia, um, the um, ethnic homogenization of Anatolia. Uh, the question that was raised was, in 1915, however, the government um, in Istanbul was still envisioning retaining the Arab territories after the war was over. Um, and how would they have thought that simply eliminating, for instance, the Greeks and Armenians would really render uh, or, or give them the ethnic, ethnic homogeneity that this is that the end, that the genocide was supposed to produce? In other words, they still would have had a very large uh, non-Turkish population, and including, of course, large uh, Christian and Jewish minorities in the uh, in the Arab regions, right? So that was one question. The other is um, just a comment, really. Um, the the Young Turk um, regime and the Turkish Republican regime did have ample precedent for uh, homogenizing the Muslim population in the Ottoman censuses themselves, because prior to uh, the Young Turk Revolution, the Ottomans in the 19th century had conducted multiple censuses. Um, and it's interesting to look at those censuses because all of the Muslims are in one category. Mm -hmm. So that just, I mean, they were building on a, a homogenization that, that already existed, as it were, in the Ottoman era. Thank you for your lecture. According to the United Nations Convention, UNICEF, acknowledged today the massacre of Armenian genocide. Who is recognized as it genocide and who doesn't? Mm -hmm. Was anyone held to account internationally? And what about the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and is still the relation between Armenia and Turkey uh, forestry? Thank you. It, what, was the, what was the last question? Is still the relation between Armenia and uh, Armenian Turkey uh, is still frosty mm -hmm. about the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh mm -hmm. uh, conflict? Thank you. Hi, um, thank you, Hagen, for this lecture. Um, my question is a little similar, or it touches upon what Dr. Reimer was talking about. Um, <clears throat> what, from it, where did the superiority of the Balkan Muslims come from in Turkey, or for the young Turks? I understand that they themselves were Balkan Muslims, but um, before them or during their time, where did the superiority come from? Because Arab Muslims were not were completely um, were were completely undermined. Uh, I mean, there's there's a tension between the Arab Muslims and the Turkish or the Ottoman Turkish Muslims uh, throughout that period. So, is it because the Balkan Muslims are European, um, and which is ironic because Europeans didn't see the Balkans as European. So. Um, yeah, where, where, where does their superior, superior level come from? Thank you. I think these are three questions. Okay. Uh, in, 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 thank you for this, Michael. There are, there ha, it's very interesting that it, the, in, any, in any time of, of 
dramatic change, political change, there are always different trends, political trends. So during the late Ottoman period and the war and the early Republican period in Turkey, there has been a lot of political trends. One of them called for, uh, for Ottoman citizenship, another one called for pan-Islamism, a third one called for pan-Turkism, the Turanian nationalism. But the interesting thing which I think uh, uh, you know, historians can help us answer is what leads to the success of one particular trend over another? So there, there was, for example, a, um, a project in the f uh, early Republican period in Turkey is uh, to uh, uh, in have a more inclusive or non-nationalist, non-racial, non-sectarian system in, in Turkey that are, uh, they, call them, they call that movement the Second Republicanists, the Ikinji Cumhuriyet in Turkish, uh, which, which but what led to that, that project to disappear, basically, and the success of the uh, modernist, secularist, pan-Turkish, uh, Kemalist model of the state to, to win. So I, I don't have an answer. But what I want to complement to that, to, to that point is that uh, they, the, the, my understanding that they didn't want to include the Arabs, uh, because if we look uh, uh, closely at the Misaki Milli, the first, the, the, the first article of the Misaki Milli that I read, it says that the Arab populations that are, are living under foreign occupation. So by then, the, 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 these territories of uh, greater Syria and Iraq were, under, uh, were divided under Saks Pico, and that's why the Turkish nationalists did not want to mess with, with the British and the French. Uh, to the extent that, for example, when there is a very little uh, or insignificant treaty called the Ankara Treaty of 1921, and uh, during that treaty, basically, uh, Turkey, um, sorry, France occupied a, a, a big portion of southern Anatolia into uh, basically uh, uh, Adana. It goes from Syria like this, like a triangle. And after the Ankara Treaty of 1921, the French armies withdraw to the current border. So the current border was drawn in 1921 when the French ceded that territory to the Turks, and the Turks would not claim the the, the Syrian provinces anymore, with the exception of uh, Iskandaron Alexandretta that the French gave, gave it to Turkey in 1938, I think, in order as a bribe. So the, the Turkish government enters uh, World War II on the side of the French and the British. Then they took the, the area and then the war ended. They kept the land, uh, but they, they never really fought for that. So after 1921, the majority of the Armenians living in that area ended up on ships to France, 60,000 of them. And this is basically what constitutes the current Armenian diaspora in France. They didn't leave during the genocide. They left under French occupation. And this is it's very important because it's very easy to blame the Turkish nationalist movement on the expulsion of Armenians. But how about the French colonial and British colonial policies that encouraged because these people uh, uh, left with, uh, with um, uh, travel documents saying the reason for travel that he cannot go back. So then after they left and the republic was established, the, the, actually before the republic was established, they issued a law saying that those, the population that left after the war, the, during the war, are not allowed to return. And this brings the question of property. So they cannot return, they cannot become Turkish citizens, they cannot claim their property, okay? And on these bases, they arrived to France and Greece at the time in 1921 as uh, stateless, uh, ap 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 it's, uh, stateless, uh, stateless uh, uh, refugees. Now, who recognizes, so you mean who recognizes the genocide as genocide? Who doesn't recognize the genocide as genocide? Uh, well, Turkey doesn't, obviously. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, Israel has been basically denying the genocide because, of, uh, because they want to preserve the uniqueness uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, the US is, has been very ambiguous. Uh, 
So these are, I think, the three, I think, important countries that, the, the majority of the countries that recognize the genocide are places like uh, Canada, France, I think Switzerland, uh, Greece, what? Austria, uh, yeah, so mainly, mainly, I mean, those who deny the genocide, I mean, I, but I, after all, I don't want to really, it doesn't matter who recognizes the genocide. I mean, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact. And governments are not, this is not the duty of governments to tell us what to name and what to call things. Uh, but obviously it's important because of the legal implications of it. But I mean, whether uh, and the American government or the Israeli government say it's a genocide or not, it will not change what actually happens. So I'm not really into, into labels uh, and, and I don't want you know, the, the whole, this whole idea really is, is, is really troubling that, you know, uh, you are killed and you need to prove that you are killed. But the very evidence, the dead body, the dead body is the evidence of the genocide, right? The dead body is dead. How can a dead body witness? I mean, we don't have the, the number of evidence uh, like the like we get, for example, in other genocides, like the Jewish genocide, the Holocaust. We don't get that in the Armenian case. And there has been a lot of uh, the, the evidence. You see, see, for example, one telegram saying "kill Armenians," another telegram, "make sure you don't kill Armenians and put the, send them into a safe part of the desert." Well, it was summer; also, people died. So, is this then a, uh, a, a an evidence of genocide, of intention to annihilate? Okay, but then this brings us to the whole question of, for me, the evidence of genocide is looking at what happened to the Armenians, Armenian citizens of Turkey after the genocide has happened. Because genocide is not an event that starts and ends in history. I understand genocide as a process. The, the fact that Abdullah Gül considers the, an insult to be called an Armenian this is, raises a question on why would he feel that way? If it wasn't for, as we talked yesterday, Michael, about the, the whole idea of the foundational violence of the state. A lot of states have, were established on violence. Actually, most states, so there is no state without army and killing, as uh, Charles Stilley tells us. Uh, so, but this is part of the foundational violence of the state. And challenging, uh, is speaking about the Armenian genocide as a genocide, puts into question the entire Turkish Republic and the founders of the Republic in question. So it is basically very difficult, very much like Israel uh, acknowledging the 1948 war as ethnic cleansing, because it questions the very foundation or the moral superiority, the anti, because both Turkey and Israel are, uh, they, 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 they have the rhetoric of the anti-colonial uh, war of independence, that the Turks uh, established a state uh, that is opposed to the colonial endeavors and the, and the, and the Zionist forces uh, that the British in the 1940s called terrorists uh, basically uh, said that we were fighting the British occupation of Palestine and they call the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, as their war of independence. But it is, again, foundational violence. So there is a lot of, I think, not only political and legal reasons, but there is also uh, emotional and psychological uh, uh, aspects of, the, of, of such uh, recognition. Uh, about Nagorno-Karabakh, it is very interesting uh, the, the way that Nagorno-Karabakh plays an important uh, aspect in the Turkish-Armenian uh, relations. Uh, particularly, I'm, I'm not talking about the Armenians of Turkey now, I'm talking about the Republic of Armenia, because uh, the, uh, Azerbaijan is a very strategic ally of Turkey on many levels. Uh, but there is also the Turkish, uh, the, 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 the Turkic states, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, uh, 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 Uzbekistan and so on, are have a special status in Turkey. They are like, they call them our brothers in a way because of the common uh, uh, language and so on. So 
a lot of uh, international relations uh, experts would tell you that if it wasn't for Azerbaijan the, 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 and the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Turkish-Armenian border would have been opened. But Azerbaijan has been systematically putting pressure on the Turkish government on not to open the Armenian uh, border in order to pressure the Armenian government on ceding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is has, I think it's 98% Armenian, but there is a lot of oil involved there as well. So there is, again, that, uh, that, that conflict. Now, what makes the superiority of the Balkan Muslims? This is a very, very good question, actually. But I'm not sure whether it is the superiority of all Balkan Muslims or the, the superiority of the, uh, the, the, the fact that a lot of the elites of the Ottoman state were Balkan Muslims, and their superiority or their basically elitism comes from the fact that they were uh, educated uh, in European style uh, Ottoman institutions. A lot of them were military institutions uh, that were built by the uh, Ottoman state after the Tanzimat period, which was Tanzimat where the process of modernizing the Ottoman state. Uh, uh, so their superiority, I think my understanding of it comes from there. And there was the idea that we can be modern and we can establish a modern nation state, uh, very much like Europe, basing it on whatever makes us peculiar. And what makes us peculiar is that we are Turkish and Muslims, basically. And that, that's so the very the, the, the way the, uh, the the way the to say Turkey in in in, in Turkish, Turkiye, is the Italian the Italian name and pronunciation for the Ottoman Empire. So there, there has been this fascination with Europe. The penal code was taken from uh, Mussolini's uh, Italy, for example. And they brought Eng uh, German linguists to modernize the, 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 to Latinize the Turkish alphabet, moving it from Latin, from uh, Arabic script to uh, Latin script. And that's why when you look at it, it looks like German because of the, the vowels with dots on the top. So there, there, there were a lot of fascination, basically, with Europe that never ended, I think. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Hello. So just wait for uh, My name is Wasim. Uh, my name is Wasim, and I want to ask if there is any kind of documentation about the Armenian so I can talk without a microphone because I read an article recently saying that after 1916, uh, some people actually registered names of a whole village people that were killed and they documented no, this in the League of Nations. This is correct, you have any information about it. And this is important because there is a difference between the existence of the genocide from a legal perspective than not existing. Otherwise, the Turkish one actually maybe to this extent uh, fight against the word genocide. Your question? You mentioned that uh, to be uh, Turk, uh, you have to be a Sunni Muslim. What about the Shia? Around 20 percent. More questions? Yes. Why is the direction? And we were in the wrong place, in the wrong time, so they had to move us. Hmm. Or was it? an actual Christian place. Which one was it? Because the way we're looking at it geographically now, now is that kind of we ended up being in the wrong place, the wrong time, we were inconveniently in, in their way, and they just needed to switch that, to switch the people. Or was it directed and Throughout that whole period, was it only targeted Armenians or there were other minorities which were non-Muslim? In that specific geographic 
demographic. And of course, to, to add to that question, whether Armenians uh, continue being in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, thank you for this. The documentation around the, the uh, see the interesting thing about the documentation of the Armenian genocide is the fact that the there are scattered evidences, and those scattered evidence uh, doesn't really help creating a holistic view. It is, not, it is not an easy case as the case in uh, Rwanda and, and the Holocaust. So I would say that one of the best evidences of the genocide are oral historical narratives because they speak about the multiple uh, experiences of Armenians because by the way, I mean, this is uh, another topic, but when we look at the Anatolia, as I said that we, let's imagine Anatolia, Anatolian Armenians as one category. Each part of Anatolia experienced the genocide in a different way, and they have, they call it with a different label. So the Armenians of Turkey do not call the genocide with the same way, the same name. Some, in some areas that experienced the genocide during the mobilization, during the war, call it Sefer Berlik, which is in Turkish, Ottoman Turkish means mobilization of, of the army. Okay? Uh, in the village of Sasun, uh, for, they, 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 they actually they speak a very peculiar dialect of Arabic that I wasn't able to comprehend uh, a lot of it, but they, they, they use the, ter the Arabic word qafila to refer to the genocide, to speak that they were uh, uh, on the death marches. So then can we then come to that conclusion that the Sefer Berlik or the Kafila or the Syriacs, Syrian Christians call it Saifu coming from the Arabic Saif, that it was mass slaughter. Uh, are they the same? Can, then they be cons can we then put all of this experience under the legal terminology of genocide? Because genocide is, uh, is a legal terminology and it has legal implications. And that, was, that is why the fight over, over it. But when the Armenians speak about it, they are, not, they are not speaking about it in order to make a case. They are simply speaking about it out of experience. And therefore, whether they call it during the war, or Sefer Berlik, or, 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 or Kafile, or whatever, they are not trying to make a particular uh, case. Now, those who are, want to use the legal framework of genocide are legal Armenian institutions that want to come to a legal recognition in uh, the European Union and the international system uh, to call it genocide because there are legal implications uh, for that when it comes to uh, reparations, uh, property, and, and so on. So to answer your question is then you, you will find some telegraphs, you will, you will find obviously some statistics. There is a map, for example, that would tell you the number of deportation and killing in each particular uh, uh, Eastern Anatolian uh, city. But to what extent then this can be is, is legally vi uh, viable, including the oral historical accounts. I mean, which court is going to say that this was a genocide because we have, I don't know, 10, 100, 100,000 Armenian survivors say, call it speak about that experience that call it genocide, to be called genocide. But the most important aspect of the Armenian genocide recognition is that the person who, Rafael Lamkin, the person who uh, uh, coined the term genocide, that ended up being the foundation of the criminalization of the war, uh, uh, the crime of genocide in international law after 1948, used the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide as examples of what he called genocide. So then, the question is, if those who don't want to call it genocide need to go back and revise the very definition of the inventor of the term. So I call it genocide because the person who invented the name calls it genocide. Now, of course, there are a lo loads of oral historical account to verify what he did, but there was no denialism at the time. Uh, but no, but I'm sorry. Uh, there is also the convention that Turkey only started to recognize, the, uh, to deny the genocide in the 1950s and 60s when the Armenians started to mobilize politically on the recognition of the genocide. 
Now, uh, uh, revisionist hist uh, Turkish historians say, no, the denial of the genocide is foundational from the early Republican period, and you see that in the, uh, the insinuations of, uh, of uh, or, or the way Mustafa Kemal Atatürk narrates Turkish history in his long speech. He was giving a speech, I think, for six days, called the uh, Nutuk in Arabic. It's an Arabic word, the speech. And you can go and buy it. It's like the like the foundational Bible of, of, of the Turkish Republic. And those who worked on the, on the representation of Armenians in the speech, the Nutuk, comes to the conclusion that says that the denial of the Armenian genocide is foundational to the Turkish understanding of history. So this is, uh, and this is where I think the, 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 the the, 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 hist the historiography and, the, and, and, and historians are involved uh, politically. Uh, the, about the Shia Muslims, this is, is a very, very good question because then we can, uh, so when we speak about the Shia Muslims in Turkey, I think you mean the Alavis, right? Uh, which is a sect, again, yet a subsect of Shia Islam. Uh, some even ne don't consider the Muslims, but that's another, uh, another, another question. But around 20% of the population of Turkey is Alavi. And there is ambiguity around this population because on one level they are not Sunni Muslims, but they are not recognized as Alavis. And there has been many movements to recognize them in legal documents in order also to help them build uh, Alavi uh, uh, places of worship, which is again another implication of the recognition of minority. So there is this ambiguity around the Alavi population. On one hand, they are not Sunni Muslims, so there is a question mark around their, whether, whether they fit 100% in the, in the uh, homogenization of the, of the population. The other aspect of it is that because during the Ottoman period, to be a Turk was to be an Anatolian unsophisticated villager. With the Republican period, to be a Turk was a sort of a pride. Now, who were the real Anatolian villager yeah. Turks? They are the Alavis. So then, Istanbul as a cosmopolitan city becomes the, uh, and Izmir, because they are coastal, had lots of Armenians, uh, uh, Rome Orthodox and, uh, and Jews, and Italians and others. There, there is, a, there, there is a, this, uh, uh, a nickname, the nickname is Mir especially because of that uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. They call it Gavur Izmir. Gavur is the Turkish word for kafir. Uh, the K becomes a G in, some, in Turkish because of that. So then Anatolia that was considered to be unsophisticated and basically fallahin, redneck sort of, becomes the source of authentic Turkish identity. So they would send then linguists to Anatolian villagers to trying to find the, uh, the authentic Turkish words in order to remove the Arabic word from the dictionary and substitute it with Turkish words. When they weren't able to find certain Turkish substitutes for words, they sent linguists to Central Asian republics in search of Turkish words. And that's why I've got, by the way, a very interesting uh, etym the etymological dictionary uh, of the Turkish language written by an Armenian, an Istanbul Armenian, Sevan Nishanyan, his name. Uh, and you have words, for example, it tells you this is Turkish, this is French, this is Arabic, this is Persian, this is Armenian, this is Greek. And then some words you find between brackets, 1932. <laughs> because they are new words invented in 1932. They don't have an origin. They were just invented. So this is where the ambiguous position of, uh, of the Alavis in Turkey. They are a source of authenticity, but we don't want to recognize them because of the homogeneity of, of the Republic. There is this double. And of course, they are also, uh, the Alavis are known to be not, uh, not religious in, from the Sunni Muslim perspective. So they fit well in the secular aspect uh, uh, element of the Republic. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, Turkey that doesn't uh, is always uh, keeps you going. Uh, now the question. I mean, this is this is a question that a lot of historians struggle with, whether it was a direction, whether it was Christian cleansing or it was a direction. Now th there is a, a group of historians 
are actually nationalists that want to, that always speak about the ethnic cleansing, the Armenian genocide, so they stand say, there is the Armenian genocide, the Syriac Christian genocide, and the Greek genocide. And basically, Turkey becomes the perpetrator of all of this. So, uh, so there is this trend. There is another trend that looks at, at it in situational, in a particular time and place, what happened, because basically the Turks did not wake up in the morning and said, well, let's kill some Armenians today. Okay, it has origins. And that, the origins of it uh, comes from the, uh, the uh, foreign governments uh, claiming protection of the Christian population that started in the 1500s, by the way. The, the French king got protection uh, of the uh, gave, uh, protection of the of the Christians of the Ottoman Empire uh, because the Ottomans wanted the support of France uh, against the the, uh, the Habsburg at one point, and later the Russians became the protectors of the Orthodox Christians of the empire and so on. So there are these two trends. Where do I personally fit? I go with the second one because I don't I don't think that there was a a systematic the Armenians were not killed because they were Christians it wasn't it wasn't this kind of uh, a, Christ, a Christian a war against Christians it was a war of nationalism uh, and when for example uh, the first time a Turkish diplomat started referring to the Ottoman Empire as Turkistan was after the uh, the independence of Greece Serbia and Bul Bulgaria because this was, again, the name of the Europeans of the Ottoman Empire. So we cannot really look at the, the Turkish nationalism and the ethnic cleansing of Anatolia without looking at that context. In addition, that I don't think that there was a Greek genocide in, uh, in, uh, in Anatolia because there was the Greek nation state and there was the provisions of the Lausanne Treaty and they were, uh, and they were uh, basically expelled. So they didn't need to be uh, killed because of the provisions of the Lausanne Treaty, and, and Greece also didn't want to uh, keep Muslims. So I think this is, I think looking at it in terms of a, an actual process in history is more helpful because this is where, where really things are. And don't forget that uh, a, a prominent histo Egyptian historians of Armenians in Egypt, Muhammad Rifat al-Imam, has written uh, significantly about that, and he has showed us that during the genocide, uh, Al-Azhar and Muslim scholars issued a condemnation of the killing of Armenians uh, because they said that this, this wasn't basically, that we don't agree with this. And don't forget that those who killed Armenians were not religiously Muslim, they were actually secular modernist Turks who happened to belong to Islam, but they, they didn't, the, it, it is different than the idea of uh, utilization of, of religion for political violence as we, we have seen with some of the uh, jihadi and Salafi and Daeshi movements and so on. It was a bit different at, at that time. So I hope he, I, I made some sense. Yes. Uh, can you tell us what happened in Izmir? Izmir. Oh, Izmir, 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 Izmir. Yeah, Smyrna. Well, Izmir is, is actually, yeah, it's, there is again a conflict in historiography of what happened to Izmir. So there is the contention between the Greeks and the Turks on whether the Greeks burned Izmir as they were leaving the city into this, the Turkish army was pushing them in the sea, or the Turkish army burnt it to push the Greeks into the sea. And they keep fighting about this uh, as, a, as a proper Greek-Turkish uh, you know, war of narratives uh, exists. But Izmir was very significant because Izmir was, again, uh, we have to think of Greek nationalism and their imagination of, uh, of geography. Uh, after World War I, the Greek state, with the support of the British, was, uh, was claiming Constantinople because it was, I think, 54% 55% non-Muslim, and at least 50% of the population of it were Greek speakers. And so is Izmir, the second largest, uh, 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 yes, is Izmir and Salonika as well. So basically Greece uh, claimed Izmir and the cities the, around it and Constantinople as part of the Greek state because it has predominantly 
Greek speak Greek speaking Orthodox Christians. I refuse to call them Greek Orthodox. That's another uh, talk. Uh, but. Uh, uh, and and uh, when the Ottoman Empire was pushed to sign the Treaty of Sevres, which was which there is a, a there is by the way there is in Turkey there is something called the Sevres Syndrome. I'm not sure if you know because this this Treaty of Sevres basically they forced four treaties the uh, Versailles, Sevres, uh, Neuilly, and, uh, and uh, were, were signed by with, with, uh, with, uh, with the four losers of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the World War I. And the Ottoman Empire portion, uh, Germany was with uh, Versailles, the Ottoman Empire was with Sevres, and they actually divided, I wish I had the map, but they divided Anatolia so the entire eastern, uh, western Anatolia and, and, uh, and the areas around Constantinople were to become part of Greece. Uh, they took the, the, the map of, uh, of, um, of uh, Sykes-Pico and they gave the French whatever they wanted from central Anatolia. The British had a part. The Italians had part of southwestern Anatolia and a huge Armenian uh, uh, Republic in eastern Anatolia, leaving basically the central Black Sea coast going into Ankara and, and Anatolia like this to be only the Turkish state. So this was the, the, and this was in a way what prompted Mustafa Kemal. And then after that, the Greek, the, the, there was also the Greek invasion of Asia Minor supported by the British, but then the British never sent military uh, when, the, when Mustafa Kemal landed on the Black Sea and started uh, marching from uh, eastern Anatolia, meeting the Greek uh, our forces and then pushing them into, uh, into Izmir. So uh, the, the expulsion of the Armenians of Izmir happened in the context of the expulsion or the fleeing. I don't want to, uh, I don't know which version to use, but the expulsion or the fleeing, even before signing the Lausanne Treaty. So when the Greeks and the Turks were signing the Lausanne Treaty, they uh, basically, there were already a, a significant number of Greek speakers from Asia Minor already on boats arriving to the Greek islands and mainland Greece as refugees. But the Lausanne Treaty meant that they are not allowed to go back. So yeah, Izmir, there is, uh, there is a lot of songs about Izmir, by the way, that I know. But. Any more? It's, unfortunately, it's 9.15. Oh, almost. whoa, okay. I think dinner, <laughs> uh, dinner time. So, so thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It was very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you again at our TMR talks. Uh, so uh, keep informed, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Have much. Have a good evening and a good weekend.